Today on The Real Story, the coronavirus has affected the nation's economy in a big way. And along with other factors, Connecticut's financial situation is taking a hit. State Controller Kevin Lembo now projecting a budget deficit of more than $60 million at mid-year. But there's lots of time for that to go even higher. How much higher? We'll ask him about it. And it's back. The debate over marijuana in Connecticut. Is it time to legalize pot for recreational use? Lawmakers once again seriously considering the possibility, so we bring the debate to the real story. Democratic State Representative Rahib Ali Brennan and Republican State Representative Vince Candelora square off. Banning hair discrimination. Hair discrimination. Connecticut con considering following other states, they're looking at a bill that would ban discrimination on the basis of a person's hairstyle, whether at school or in the workplace. This bill is called the Crown Act. And Fox 61's I Chabot will have the story for you. All today on The Real Story. Hi there, you're watching The Real Story. I'm Al Terzi alongside Jen Bernstein. Thank you, Al, and good morning to everyone at home. Another warning this week from Connecticut lawmakers not to be tempted to dip into the state's budget reserve. It comes from Connecticut Comptroller Kevin Lembo, who says we're staring at a budget deficit once again for a lot of reasons. Yes, Comptroller Lembo says the impact of the coronavirus on everybody's minds uh, is affecting the financial markets, and uh, that's part of it. But there are other factors, too, and he's with us this morning to explain. Uh, okay, so what are these other factors that are causing this deficit? It, does, it doesn't look like much, but... Yeah, I think always I want to bring perspective to that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So $63.3 million on an 18 point something billion dollar budget is a, a relatively small number. 63 million is a lot to you and me. It's got to be controlled and that gap has to be closed. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are plenty of management tools in place uh, to do that. So I don't think it's freak out time quite yet, but we got to keep an eye on uncertain financial markets, the impact of the coronavirus, if trade sort of issues rear their head again, against the backdrop of some of the revenue projections were sort of slightly off, uh, refunds are up uh, in certain categories. So all of these lead to a change in uh, some of the assumptions that underlie the budget. It's important to note too, you had issued the uh, $63 million budget deficit. That was before the coronavirus situation happened or uh, yeah, was that, uh, relatively this is uh, early um, so there there have been as we've seen significant market changes Since um, then. in, in the what's last what's your few schedule days. of making these projections Either I make them monthly month so I make them monthly and yeah. the governor's budget office makes them monthly as well um, on the 20th I go on the first and, and your, so is yours is in what relation to theirs is yours higher uh, mine is slightly your higher um, and that's really uh, for a very different issue and that is uh, there's a, an adjudicated claims account in state government where oh. we pay out lawsuits against the state and, and that they number, don't count that? they do, but our, we think it's going to be higher uh, than oh. than what they uh, presume. But but I think Jen, as you led in the intro, you know the rainy day fund is sort of folks have to like leave things alone um, because we, of these uncertainties that can crop up, like a coronavirus situation or something like that. And legislators that. did a very uh, hard thing a number of years ago. Democrats and Republicans alike they voted to uh, set aside one-time resources as they came in and stop building the budgets on the back of one-time resources, setting that money aside so that when we hit the next correction, we're not raising taxes and cutting programs as you go down into the hole. Uh, so now there's money there. We're at two and a half billion dollars in the rainy day fund. That's thirty. 13.8 percent of general fund appropriations. It's got to get to 15, uh, but uh, it's a little hard to hide two and a half billion dollars. I don't quite have a coat big enough. Um, and then everybody's got a plan for it. And yeah. some of them are understandably sympathetic arguments, and other the uh, other arguments are uh, a little off the wall. Uh, the public option health insurance idea, that concept, you, we've been talking about this for two or three years right. uh, in, different, uh, in different forms. Uh, where does that stand this year? And you got a short session, so and yes. a lot of other things competing for attention. Uh, give us a lowdown. Sure. So the Connecticut plan, uh, which is that public option, as you uh, mentioned, uh, has been up a couple of times. And this year it comes back in a slightly different form. Uh, there's differences in the way we're going to handle risk in the pool, which are not worth exploring because we need 45 minutes to 
do just that. Uh, but beyond that, it includes different groups. Uh, it includes small businesses under 50 employees. It includes nonprofits of any size. It includes multi-employer union Taft-Hartley plans, uh, which is a, another constituency that's really suffering uh, under escalating insurance premiums. But at the heart of this, is year after year we have this conversation about something needs to be done. Legislators knocked doors in 2018 and the number one and two things they heard from their constituents were healthcare relief and pharmaceutical pricing. Um, now guess what, it's 2020 and it's time to knock those doors again. So someone's gotta figure out what they're gonna tell their constituents. A, what did you do? Not just tinkering around the edge and B, what health plan do you have, legislator? What health plan do I have? I have a very good health plan sponsored by the state. Why would we not be willing to share that on a pay for... And you've been saying sense. that, trumpeting that for a long time, and uh, you don't get the sense that anybody's listening? I do. I do get the sense that folks are listening, uh, but there's a very powerful lobby uh, that objects uh, to that idea. The insurance uh, companies. The insurance Some companies, yeah. and they're a big yeah. employer in Connecticut, and I'm not tone deaf to that, but at the same time, uh, large insurance companies have been uh, losing employees outsourcing, offshoring, a lot of those jobs for a lot of years. The, the whole paradigm is shifting. Their business model is aging and it's in a sort of decline. Um, and the smart insurance companies, and there are some in Connecticut, have figured out what else do we do relative to this to keep ourselves in the mix. The others that just want to sort of bring the cash register and continue to raise rates are, are going to see a continued deterioration of their book of business. Um, and you can't fight the inevitable, and I would argue that this is inevitable. Do you think you can get this done this session and uh, during this short session? I think so. I think, uh, again, with the right organizing, the right group of people, and the right legislators uh, who are helping us uh, to, to count those votes, I think we can get there. There really is an, uh, an option. Uh, we've reached the point where more and more folks are walking away from their health insurance. Uh, folks have health insurance, uh, but with very high deductibles, and so never meaningfully interact with an actual benefit. They're just paying, and they pay a high deductible and unless they have a catastrophic illness, they don't touch it. I think enough is enough, and we as the people of Connecticut have to stand up and let our elected representatives know that you know, we want Senate Bill 346, we want the Connecticut plan as an option. But if, Just this, an option. if this is going to impact uh, the insurance industry, especially here, we used, to be, we used to be the insurance capital of the world, it seemed. Sure. I remember talking about that. Uh, if it's going to do that and affect jobs, uh, how do we get past that obstacle? I, I read that the Cigna CEO even uh, suggested that he might have to pull up because he would be so, the company would be so hurt by this public option plan. Yeah, uh, look, uh, th that company denies saying that now, which is a very interesting turn. But you know, we'll set that aside for a second. Um, when you look at job growth in the state and in the nation, it is not in the super large employers. And I understand, like these are real people; these are our neighbors who work there. So again not tone deaf to that issue, mm -hmm. but the growth area is coming from small and medium sized businesses and those are the ones who are struggling the most. You talk to any legislator at the Capitol and say, tell me about small business and they'll say small business is the engine of our economy. And then you have to ask them, what did you do for them? What have you done for them lately that doesn't mean picking wi winners and losers with small economic development grants, but rather creates a base that allows them all to have better balance sheets because you're helping them get a more affordable product uh, uh, based on what I'm already doing for the state employee and retiree plan. Where does this bill stand at this point? It was heard this week in the Insurance and Real Estate Committee. Um, it's probably going to have to touch the Appropriations Committee, uh, hopefully mm -hmm. quickly, uh, and then it's got to get to the floor for a vote. Um, and so I can't stress enough that uh, those folks who are struggling uh, need to call their legislator and don't wait and don't wait until tomorrow. Call today. But there are people who are a little antsy about a public option. They're thinking about a government plan, and then they, they start taking that down the road into uh, single payer and, sure. and that kind of thing, and that's what it's going to end up being. Yeah. Uh, you know, how do you take care of those concerns? Yeah, well, I mean, look, you just have to explain the facts to people. This is not a single payer system. This is putting an option in the space where these other companies are still competing. It competes directly with them. And if it works well, Al, what it does is bring coverage to more people not strip coverage away from uh, people away from other companies, and it puts downward pressure on pricing because now the private companies are going to have to compete. So, you know, I'm unsympathetic to huge multi-million dollar bonuses. I just am because this is health care and we need to think about this a different way. Right. I don't get one of those, so I can keep my costs low. <laughs> so Elizabeth Warren is out of the running for president. 
and you supported her. I did. I endorsed her, and I normally don't do that, but I decided I was going to put my support behind the smartest candidate and the smartest woman in this case. Well, there were other smart people there. Are you going to pick one? Uh, not yet. Not at this point. I think you know we need to see how things develop now. You know, we're down to you know two candidates, and they're going to make VP choices, and we got conventions and other primaries coming. Right. So, you know, what the controller of Connecticut thinks about a presidential election really doesn't matter to you, most people. <laughs> you were saying that you're a super delegate. Uh, yeah, to the That's... national convention as a statewide elected official. Okay, I didn't what realize that. What makes you that. super? Uh, I'm really not. Yeah. I'm just a guy doing a job. Super delegates <laughs> are important. Um, all right, Comptroller Kevin Lembo, always good to have you on. Great to see you both. Um, and have a conversation with you. Thank you. Keep us updated. Still to come today on The Real Story, the push to provide legal protection for people who wear natural hairstyles at school or in the workplace. What the Crown Act entails and why supporters believe it's time for Connecticut to act. But next, right after a quick break, a renewed effort at the state capitol to legalize marijuana for recreational use. There was a public hearing about that this past week, and we have state representatives Rahab Ali Brennan and Vince Candelora on deck, ready to argue their respective positions. And coming up right after The Real Story, it's Real People with Stan Simpson on his show today, All Things UConn Women's Basketball. The current's Alexa Philippou talks about the year and the upcoming postseason. Some say the 11-time national champions are peaking. So stick around for that. The Real Story, though, will continue right after a quick break.